and he, he actually states that there is no limit. The limits are controlled by taxation and interest rates, and that's, I think, the simplest way of trying to explain it. There is no limit. The government can buy anything that's available for sale in its own currency, including all idle labour that's currently on a productive view. And so the question then should shift to, well, how much should the government spend, not whether it can spend. Yet the politicians short-circuit that discussion by saying they can't spend. How do you get like an accurate understanding for fixed exchange rates? Could then I think it'll be easier to fight there in accuracy. Okay, so the question relates to the exchange rate regime that a nation runs. So you can either fix your exchange rates that peg them against other currencies, or you can float them in the foreign exchange market and they supply and demand set the price of the currency. What most people don't understand is that in August 1971, when President Nixon abandoned the gold convertibility to the US dollar under the previous Bretton Woods Agreement, that the whole world changed. And we ended the era of fixed uh, of uh, fiat currency systems. Now it's not exactly true to say that everyone started off with fixed exchange rates and then shifted over. There's been lots of different arrangements in history of monetary systems. But in, in general, no country should peg their currency against another. And the reason for that is because as soon as you peg your currency to another, you lose control of your domestic policy. And the reason for that is that domestic policy then has to be has to work not to maintain full employment and whatever. It has to work to stabilise the exchange rate. And the Bretton Woods system, which was agreed on uh, after the Second World War as a, uh, a means of maintaining financial stability, global financial stability, that dramatically failed. And that's why it was abandoned finally. And the reason it failed is because countries that were running exchange, uh, external deficits, current account deficits, in other words, they were importing more than they were exporting, say, as an example, they were always faced with deflationary bias in their domestic economy. Why? Because their central bank, because the, the um, current account deficit meant that it was manifested in foreign exchange markets with more people wanting to sell their currency than wanting to buy it. They wanted to sell it to buy the imports, and people wanted to buy it to buy the exports. Uh, and so if you've got a current account deficit, there's more people wanting to sell your currency than wanting to buy it. And so that puts downward pressure on the exchange rate. Now under the Bretton Woods Agreement, uh, that required the central bank to intervene into the foreign exchange market and address that excess supply of currency. And they did that by uh, um, withdrawing currency from the money markets. And they did it also by pushing up interest rates so that uh, uh, capital would, out uh, in the capital account of the balance of payments, you would attract foreign direct investment to try to alleviate the gap in the trade account. Now, higher interest rates, withdrawing the money supply, that's highly deflationary. And the problem was then that countries like France and, and Britain were always faced with this stop-go growth process where they'd start to grow a bit and increase employment and the current account would go into deficit and then central bank would have to intervene to defend the exchange rate and then they'd have to push the economy into stop again, recession. And so politically that was an unsustainable system. Countries like Germany could wax lyrical because they had always current account surpluses mostly, and so there was no domestic deflationary bias in that situation. They just sit back and say, OK. And so that system collapsed because it was unviable. And the only viable system is a, uh, is a flexible exchange rate system where you, you don't tie up domestic policy to defending an exchange rate. You tie up domestic policy to targeting things that matter, like employment and uh, infrastructure and things like that. And one of the major problems of the whole European mess over the last 
50 years has been they've been trying to hang on to fixed exchange rates in one month form or another. You know, they had, they had the snake in the early 70s in the tunnel, then the snake got out of the tunnel because it couldn't stay in it, and then they had the ERM, and then they finally morphed into the EMU. But all of those systems failed because the structure of the French and German and Italy, Italian and Spanish economy is incapable of supporting stability of exchange rates between them without uh, dire consequences for the deaths of countries. Our own party sold us out and accepted neoliberal principles was, wasn't, is, is, is not actually saying that the left response wasn't there. No, that's true. I mean, obviously, when, when uh, uh, in, the, in the second second Wilson government, Tony Benn presented a very uh, coherent national industry strategy to the, the cabinet, and that uh, Dennis Healy did all that he could to discredit that. So it's absolutely clear that there were elements in the left. But I was talking about the sort of dominant political voice of the left. There were clearly elements of the left that worked very hard to try to reverse the narrative and to, and to offer creative and workable alternative policy structures, but they were just trampled on. That's what I meant. The, the, the dominant political left has led us down. And whether that would lead to devaluation, and uh, they're not very convinced about that taxes, you know, control the value of the currency, and uh, I found it very difficult to kind of break through that wall. Um, yeah, I mean, this is these uh, this amorphous international global finances that are somehow omnipresent and all powerful. Well, what happened in 2000, December 2001 in Argentina? They they got their comeuppance, didn't they? They Argentina basically defaulted on the debt. All their, all their foreign currency debt when the bank crisis occurred in late 2001, December. And they were threatened with uh, never being able to get foreign direct investment again. And what happened was, yeah, the, the uh, Argentinian currency initially did depreciate, that's true. But the Argentinian government, and I was somewhat involved in this at the time through their employment minister, they introduced the Head of Households program, which was a job guarantee, effectively, guaranteeing a certain number of hours to one member of each household. And within uh, two quarters, so six months, around 700,000 people were employed in that, that program, which um, stabilised domestic spending and allowed the economy to return to growth fairly quickly after the massive banking crash. And what did you then see? you start to see foreign debt direct investment creeping back in. And uh, not from the first world sources initially, but from uh, Venezuela and China and Russia. But then by 74, what did you see? First world foreign direct investment coming back in. Well, how the hell does that happen if, we, you, if you're never going to get a cent from us again? And by, uh, by 2005, so four years, less than four years after the crisis, the Central Bank of Argentina was doing all it could to stop the exchange rate appreciating, so strong was the economy, and so strong was foreign direct investment in place. And I said, there, was a, there was a press conference where the Minister for Finance for the government around 2005 was asked by international press, how do you explain this, Minister? That you're now rolling in money, yet just four years ago you defaulted and you took on the, the global financial interests. And he said, one word, greed. And what the point, the point he was making was that the financial markets are not the ideologues. So the people you talk to are just the ideologues, probably. The financial market guys who, guys being generic, women and men, uh, who stand on the, in front of the trading screens, they don't give a stuff. Whether there's a deficit or a surplus or what, they're looking for arbitrage opportunities and, and ways in which they can exploit decimal points in 
financial assets. And if an economy is growing, it has a stable political system, then it will be very attractive for global capital. So I just disregard all that. That's just fear making. Look at Iceland. It's, it's told the banks to jump in the lake. <laughs> it's tied up the two big hedge funds with capital controls. Its exchange rate initially depreciated and now the Bank of Iceland can't keep it down. You know, I think most of the Labour Party now is trying to move away from neoliberalism and it strikes me that John McDonnell would be very receptive to a lot of these ideas if we knew about them, if we had any dialogue. Well, apparently there have been attempts to make meetings, but uh, they haven't happened. Do you want to be any What's that? Would you like to be I talk to anybody. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> bring, bring him up. Uh, from, if you ask for your finance trader, you know, they say, you know, volatility is their friend. And when I look at these booms and busts, I see that really it's the capital class who is doing any gain. Perhaps you comment on that, Bill, and just, I'd just like to thoughts. Well, you need price variation to exploit it. That's the, that's the bottom line. And uh, I just finished writing a three-part historical series on uh, uh, an agreement when the US Federal Reserve was uh, founded in 1930. 13. It was uh, entered a, an agreement with the Treasury that it would uh, directly buy US government debt uh, at such levels which would stabilize, keep interest rates stable and very low. Um, and uh, through the next 20 odd years, there was uh, uh, that would work very well. Uh, the conservative forces in the central bank wanted to. Uh, alter that because they feared that that would ultimately be inflationary. This is a uh, government buying up just basically, uh, basically government spending just being ratified by the central bank. What's now called overt monetary financing. And of course you look at the data for that year and nothing bad happened. It was just a good strong growth period, good employment, good wages growth, high productivity growth. Uh, but eventually the central bank forces uh, became so angry about this agreement that they wanted to undermine it. And if you, what's not well known, though, if you go and explore the historical documents, what you find is that the whole central bank push was coming from the New York Federal Reserve Branch, uh, and the New York Federal Reserve Branch was getting bullied by Wall Street, who wanted interest rates to be moving up and down. They didn't want stable interest rate structure anymore. So yeah, I mean, uh, that's, that's the fact. Now we might have all sorts of political issues with, with China, but I, I wonder what sort of lessons you think we might learn from uh, the way the Chinese economies uh, developed uh, over the last sort of um, first 40 years. Well, the, the only thing I can say is that the Chinese are much smarter than most of the Anglo countries. And uh, I'm not defending, I think they've got appalling human rights records in the rest of it. And, uh, uh, I'm not commenting on that, but uh, I'm not a dispute that I'm not. <laughs> that I'm commenting about something separate. And what, if you go back to the, uh, the early days of the global financial crisis, the country that had the biggest fiscal stimulus was China. Because they knew that their export sector was collapsing because of the collapsing of their imports. Importers. America, Europe. And so they knew that they had to rapidly redirect spending from, the, from income coming from the export sector to domestic expenditure. And they just did it. And they hardly blinked. And, it, and so it wasn't their export strength that saved them, it was their fiscal deficit. And uh, that every country could have followed that. Um, example. As, and you know, the other thing that the Chinese are really good at is uh, 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 development of public infrastructure and particularly their education sector. So for years, countries like Australia, and I mean Britain as well, and the US, but Australia, we get our government has hacked so badly into our tertiary education system 
that they forced us to earn external income, and that comes from historically from Chinese students. But the myopia of the neoliberalism in Australia is that they haven't quite worked out. The China was that was only a temporary thing for the Chinese. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, they're investing incredibly in their higher education sector. They're sending their graduates away to foreign universities, getting first class education, and they're going back to and they're the future academics in China. And so within another five, maybe six years, our Australia's foreign income from Chinese students is just going to disappear. And we just don't know what to do about that. People just don't even deny about that. So, you know, countries, China demonstrates, and, may, and it has been said that, well, they can get away with it because they can trample human rights, they can trample, in, you know, uh, planning restrictions on urban land use and all of this. Well, there's not the truth in that. But what they do demonstrate is that uh, a central government with its own currency can rapidly improve the standard of living of their citizens if they want it. Capital controls in the context of uh, Iceland. Um, would there be any downside for this country in producing them tomorrow? Or certainly after the next GSC. What do you think they might be? Um, I can't think of any. <laughs> the, the reality is that uh, uh, if you study the fixed exchange rate arrangements of Europe from you know, the snake in the early 70s through to the ERN in the 80s. What's the snake? Uh, the snake was. Uh, um, so what happened was the Bretton Woods system was the post-war consensus that most countries were in, that fixed exchange rates against the US dollar, and then the US dollar was pegged against an ounce of gold in value. And countries had a small band up and down in which the currency could fluctuate, and they, the central banks had, were responsible for maintaining those parities. That's the Bretton Woods system. When, in August 71, when President Nixon abandoned that system effectively by denying the convertibility of the US dollar back into gold, the whole basis of the system collapsed. And if you think back about your own country here, in the 60s, I mean, there was just major currency crisis one after another, because you just couldn't keep the, you couldn't, you couldn't maintain the parities. And uh, the interesting thing was that uh, the Bank of England did their best as to, because, because for some reason, right, they had this ridiculous idea that your currency meant some status. That you, that you should have just devalued straight away, but you, you refused to because, you know, you, the sterling, gosh, you know, you lost your colonies years ago, but you're still, still hanging on to the sterling. But uh, what happened was when uh, the, the Bretton Woods system collapsed, the Europeans decided to have their own fixed exchange rate system and carry on. And the reason for that is because they had the common agricultural policy. And a common agricultural policy would be very difficult to operate because of the complexity of the price structures uh, with flexible exchange rates. There'd be so much variation that they just couldn't manage it. And so the problem really was the common agricultural policy, but they didn't see that. Yeah. And, and that's mainly because of the dominance of the rural lobby both in Germany and France. But so they decided they had to keep their exchange rate fixed between the, what, how many were there then? Five or something like that. And so they devised the system that they called the snake in the tunnel. And the tunnel was the variation up and down between the agreed parities, and the snake was the evolution of the exchange rate. And within about a year of the group, this elaborate agreement, the snake escaped the tunnel because <laughs> it just couldn't, it just was not operational. And the point, the, the point is, that then they morphed into other types of uh, you know, new agreements and what have you, which ultimately became must be. But um, the only way there was any, any stability of uh, currencies in, the Euro in Europe during that period was because they all had capital controls. And uh, Italy, particular times, massive capital controls. And uh, what brought an end to them was the single market policy in 1987. And that was uh, Delors' first grand statement of neoliberalism, effectively. And that, that gave, forced the countries to transit away from capital controls. And then, of course, Maastricht came a few years later, 
and what that what that didn't take away the tensions that were embedded within the exchange rate. All that meant was that the adjustment couldn't come from exchange rate variation, but from domestic wages and prices and employment and pensions and you know, so-called internal devaluation. But it was it was only workable in as much as you say it was vaguely workable because of the capital controls. And even the IMF, who were vehemently opposed to all capital controls for years and years, even the IMF now are saying the capital controls now have a place. And, you know, in the 1997 Asian financial crisis, all of the countries, Thailand, Indonesia, those countries had massive, South Korea, had massive currency crashes. Which country did it? Malaysia. Why? Because the government immediately imposed capital controls. So this idea that, oh, the, the amorphous, omnipresent financial markets can kill an economy, well, no, they can't if the state doesn't let them. Because the state can just stop them taking their money out, like they did in Iceland. Housing has become a real issue, and people are saying, Look, we don't have enough houses where we've got jobs. Actually, what we've got is loads of houses where there are no jobs. And so perhaps we should start thinking about turning, you know, the way that we look at resources, how we use resources, and what government does in order to employ those resources, and what we've got and what we've got to do. Uh, and, you know, I mean, it's everywhere. In Sydney, for example, during the, the Olympics. The, a lot of the Olympics were run by so-called volunteers and the government was eulogising the, the volunteers. They, they, they were just jobs that people used to have that they don't get paid for anymore. And suddenly everyone's feeling, feeling good about being a volunteer. Well, stuff that. It's an outrage. But just to... I, I didn't really mean to dismiss that the pinky question because I, I was just thinking about it. Um, one of the problems that we get involved with is arguing about facts a lot. And so we, we get in disputes with right-wingers about, oh, is it, is it precarious or is it not? And what, what, uh, what the cognitive linguists tell you from their research is that if you're wanting to have a paradigm shift and change people's there's this concept in humans called construal. So construing is obviously the way we understand and learn things. But construal means that we can reverse frames. We can be stuck in one frame in, in narrative, but through appropriate use of language and being exposed to alternative frames, we can, can, we can make a shift. And uh, what they say is you shouldn't start that process so I'm thinking here about the progressive side of politics. We, you should start the pro process about arguing about facts, about you know the state of the labour market or whatever. That you start off by by developing a sense of grand purpose. So this is your sort of pithy comments. So for example, in New Zealand there was a mayor's task force on jobs. It's still operating. Started in the 90s, but then New Zealand was being absolutely ravaged by by Ruth Richardson and uh, and um, Jim Bolger's national government. And uh, the mayors the, the mayors got sick to death of the national government killing their kids, you know, with unemployment and poverty. So they took it on themselves. Now they was limited, they were limited in their capacity because they don't have the currency. But they uh, developed some catch cries like zero waste for New Zealanders and our youth, our future. And these were pithy, pithy sort of uh, general statements that began their narrative. They didn't argue about facts they, immediately because arguing about facts just triggers to develop the respective frames. You know, oh, un the high unemployment is terrible. Oh, aren't they all bludgers? Aren't they all sponges and welfare checks? You know, just you get into that sort of fighting out the narratives and the frames. But if you start to just build your argument from grand purpose and then come back down with appropriate framing and language, that, oh, well, who's responsible for zero waste of New Zealanders? What does that mean? Well, then you get a 
some subtitles well it means jobs and good education and opportunity well then you say well how do you get that and then you're sort of drilling down and you've got a whole narrative coming from these huge statements these big statements this is a future of one planet we've only got one planet with the end of it we're all gone monetary theory and everything else has got to keep up to date with it how do we do it Here are two visions of uh, the world, the society, the economy. I did discuss these for a time then. The first vision on the left is the neoliberal vision, where the economy is quite separate from us, and we are, and the planet are subservient to the needs of the economy. And the economy is a living entity uh, in that vision, and it can get sick. And it's all like, if it gets sick, it's because we're to blame. We've done something, or the government's done something uh, regulated it in some way, put a minimum wage in, or people are getting too generous pensions or things like that. And in this concept, the planet is just an expendable resource that is just another production input. Whereas you juxtapose that with the right-hand vision, you can see immediately that people are embedded in the planet. That's the first thing to know. And that, that progressive vision immediately asks questions for how we embed it, what, how, how do we relate to our planet. And so that leads to a whole series of questions about sustainability and resource use. And, uh, the, um, and I'll come back to that. And here we've got the economy here working for us. The economy is us. It's not something separate from us. We can regulate and control the economy to do whatever we want it to do. That's the, that's the point of the right-hand diagram. And so what, you know, so then you just use your imagination. What does that lead to? Well, first of all, I'm not, I'm not one of these uh, latte, croissant-eating, high-income characters that sit around on Saturday, Saturday morning in cafes talking a lot about how everybody's got to pull their belts in when I've, when I've got a very nice car. So the first point is that this is a societal problem and that we do need to have uh, a redistribution of consumption. But at the same time, we still need to have growth because if you don't have growth with increasing population growth, then there's going to be issues about uh, distribution that are real problematic because it's like uh, we're now telling uh, uh, China it's got to obey certain carbon rules that we never we never obey. We become wealthy by doing exactly what the Chinese, well Chinese are doing better but you know what I mean, that, that we're now wanting the less developed and poor countries to suspend any growth and development and prosperity so that the planet's surviving but that's the, we, we didn't do that. So there's a real problem across countries on how we mediate that balance between humanity and the, the environment. And if you've got increased population growth, you have to have increased economic growth to create employment. Now, I'll come to the client, there's one little need that I'll come back to in a minute, hold on. And so the question is that we need to, we need to have green growth. Growth per se is not bad. But environmentally destructive growth is bad, obviously. So it's, it means that we've got to have much more awareness of service sector, uh, aged care type employment, away from making mass consumption of this type of employment. And, you know, we're going on for ages about that. The, the last thing I'd say, and this is the thing that really bugs me, is that the progressives had bought hook, line and sink out the robots are coming after them. And that therefore, the, the, the government, they can't, they, there's not an, ever going to be enough jobs for people who want them. And so the only solution is that we have a UBI, a, a basic guaranteed income. Well, that's the biggest cop-out, I think, that, of all of the left. That what, you, what you're doing, as soon as you advocate a basic income, is you're ratifying the government's abandonment of its responsibility to create work for people. You're going along with the neoliberal lie that the state is powerless to create jobs. 
uh, as the government could employ every unemployed person tomorrow if it wanted to. The government chooses the unemployment rate. That's the reality. The currency issuer chooses the unemployment rate. So for, that's the first point about UBI. But the second point, think about the construct of what it means, is what, the, what the construction of an individual is. They're being really treated as a consumption unit to be kept alive with a dollop of income and then pissed off and forgotten about. Whereas we all the studies in sociology and, and psychology and, and all of those types of that research tells us that work is much more than just generating income. It's where we get self-esteem and identity from. It's where we get meet our partners in future life and all the, all the rest of it. Often. All the rest of it. And, so to, and we also know that when a person is denied work, their social networks go from that relatively quickly to that. They, they endure a sense of isolation and exclusion. And so then the question is, well, within our current cultural milieu, and so what I advocate a job guarantee, not an income guarantee. And then, then we can think rather laterally that, well, if you're going to create an environmentally sustainable world but still be able to provide jobs, then we need to have a discussion about what constitutes productive work. And so I would have, for example, I go surfing a bit. I would have surfers employed under my job guarantee, which is an unconditional job offer by the state. Now, what would they do? Would well, they go surfing? What else would they do? They would, a major problem in Australia is children die from drowning because of the misunderstanding where the rips are in the currents. I'd have some surf We know exactly where the rips are. So surfers would have school children training them on beach safety, on sand dune management where to walk and where not, so that you, the erosion doesn't occur. I'd have musicians on the job guarantee. What would they do? Play their guitars. What else would they do? They'd hold uh, rehearsals in school grounds and teach children how to put a band together. And so over time you would redefine what productive work is, away from destructive type of productive activities to more green activities. But when even sort of you know, right-wing rags are actually professing that the neoliberals are, are the enemies, perhaps for superficial reasons, do you think there's a sort of danger or kind of elision to suggesting there's a particular branch or breed of neoliberal capitalism that's you know, so dangerous and then so something is um, slightly mystified in just using that catch-all term? Well, the right-wing right rags aren't neoliberals, they're just uh, maniacs. <laughs> I, mean, the, I mean, what I'm talking about are, and I, I was trying to find the slide, I just, it must be in another slideshow, but uh, what I'm talking about is, uh, in 1971, Lewis Power, who's an American uh, lawyer, and he was uh, hired to, by industrial capital and financial capital at a time when there was a... Uh, a uh, the top end of town were starting to worry about the profit squeezes occurring because of you know workers' rights and uh, uh, wages growing in line with productivity and uh, job protections and you know even though the American welfare state was much leaner than it was say here or where I come from, uh, no, there was still a, a sense that uh, capital was under attack from the welfare and income support systems and you know, all of that. And so they hired Lewis Powell to uh, come up with a strategy. It was called the Powell Manifesto. You can read it on the internet. Lewis Powell, he later, and soon after he issued the manifesto, he became, you know, Nixon appointed him as a Supreme Court judge and he was the most conservative Supreme Court judge in US history. But the point was that, uh, and Powell's had multi-pronged strategy, and this will all resonate, uh, uh, gain control of the media, uh, gain, uh, infiltrate education systems and influence their curriculum, um, 
uh, influence the Supreme Court in the US, so because the Supreme Court is very powerful, uh, uh, develop uh, think tanks. So this idea of you know all of these Wall Street funded think tanks and the equivalents here and elsewhere, they all emerged in the 70s. Some were longer standing, but the proliferation of them occurred as part of this strategic push by capital to restore their power. And that's been, you know, you'd have to say. And so, you know, groups like Peter Peterson Foundation, a big Wall Street invent, uh, banker, who has, has his foundation just pumping out erroneous research reports every week. Well, that all started in the 70s. It was a conspiracy. It was a, it was a deliberate strategic campaign by capital. So when I talk about neoliberals, I'm talking about those sort of people, not the sort of corner street right wing <coughs> maniac who pumps that bile. Talking about organised capital, and, and it's more from industrial capital, the old, the old robber barons, you know, of the US, to financial capital now, the investment banks, the hedge funds. That's who I'm talking about. They run the agenda. Um, just in the news recently, um, I don't know if you've noticed it, but uh, the UK has had its credit rating reduced from AA plus to AA, uh, AA minus, I can't remember what that. So, <laughs> um, maybe, uh, just, I mean, should, should we be worried about that? Oh. Uh, in the early 2000s, Japan went below, uh, I've forgotten now, uh, Botswana, yeah, or Namibia, or somewhere like that, and they could went down junk junk bond status, and the finance minister said, well, "So what?" <laughs> these these credit rating agencies, despite uh, apart from being corrupt, and and the Congress investigating investigation in two thousand nine into them demonstrated categorically how corrupt they were. Because effectively, if you don't know the story, effectively they would uh, they would team up with some investment bank who was wanting to create a product, and they'd say, "Well, you pay us, and we'll give you a triple A rating." Yeah. For God's sake! And uh, uh, so, apart from being corrupt, their sovereign debt rat ratings are meaningless because effectively. Uh, Countries that issue their own currency can always meet their liabilities. Always. Now, you know, people, these characters, uh, Rogoff and Reinhardt and others like that, these, these mainstream economists, say, oh, yeah, but Japan defaulted in 1942 or something. Maybe it was 40, I don't think. Yeah, they defaulted as a political act to, to, to uh, pay back the... Americans just before Pearl, Pearl, just after Pearl Harbor. You know, that's not a that's not a, an example. So, the you know when the, the ratings agencies come to Australia and say, oh, we're putting you on watch. You know, you triple A now, but you'll be double A next time if if you don't do something. Well, it's meaningless. It has no meaning because it, then people say, oh yeah, it does have meaning because. Uh, the financial markets will force higher yields on government debt. Well, only if the government lets them. What you need to understand is that the central bank can control yields at whatever level they want. How do they do that? Well, the same way I mentioned before about that sort of 1913 to 1951 period in American history. The central bank controlled yields at about 2.25% on 10-year US Treasury bonds for 30 years. How does it do that? Well, yields are inversely related to the price of bonds. And all, this, all, of this, all the central bank has to do is say, we're going to buy unlimited amount of bonds at a fixed price, and that's it. End of story. So when you, when you understand that the central bank can control yields at whatever level it wants, including zero, if it wanted to, then you immediately understand that the bond markets, the private bond traders, really are supplicants. They're not, they're not the bosses. They operate within the 
the latitude that the central bank and the treasury departments or finance departments allow them to. And in the neoliberal era, the treasury and the central bank have mostly allowed the bond markets to set yields. In a progressive era, where well, you wouldn't even borrow, but in the progressive era, you just wouldn't do that. Bond issuance is corporate welfare. It's just giving the bond markets a risk-free asset on which they can park money when other, other assets are uncertain and risky. Ratings agencies are irrelevant. Meanwhile, the same kids in this country will be go going into dead-end jobs that are going to wear them out um, spiritually, socially, emotionally and physically. And this is not right. This is not sustainable society. And I'd like your comment, your, your, uh, um, your solution. Well, no, I, I, I agree with you. And uh, what we've created with uh, the polarisation of opportunity uh, in, and the restriction of social classes, etc., is, is an unsustainable time bomb. That's, that's a fact. And if you go back to the period after the Second World War, where I, when I grew up as the baby boomer generation, um, my, my parents were dead poor. My father was on a minimum wage. Uh, he was in uh, a soldier's home for some years after I was born, after war neuroses, and uh, couldn't work in his skill, but he was a motor mechanic. He could no longer work in that. He was, uh, so he just became a labourer. And uh, the, the things, yet yeah, his children all traversed, became university educated, and well, well off, high income earners with good prospects, good jobs. And the reason that occurred is because A, there was full employment, so my father, even though he was, had very great difficulties, could work. The, the welfare state supported his family, so that in second year at high school, fourth year at high school, there was always uh, scholarships to keep us at school and give my mother some income on top of the child endowment that she got. The Department of Social Securities always came in February at the start of the school year and gave us new uniforms and books and pencils. And that type of state intervention allowed for massive social mobility. Mm -hmm. yeah. Massive social mobility. Yeah. And, and even, the, even the less able academic kids could always get a job either an apprenticeship or they could get a job, say, within the factory system and then build up over life to maximise their, their potential. Now, now, no one's saying that everybody's going to have a good job and be happy and blithe. That's something we're talking about here. But, but you can achieve dramatic social mobility and reductions. All of that period was inequality was reducing polarisation was being reduced and compressed. And those things have been reversed now. If I had grown up where I did now, well, the suburbs changed a bit, but in a similar type of suburb, then I'd be uh, hunting around for ice to, to shoot up. That's the problem. And that's the legacy of neoliberalism as opposed to a strong state mediating the capital conflict and advancing public purpose as its goal rather than defending the interests of capital as its primary goal. Just a, just a final comment in answer to you. The, my generation, of which I can think of many in the room, is the first generation in history that is leaving our children poorer. Yeah. Yeah. First generation in history. And that's the... the, the, the Connection to neoliberalism is no, nothing, it's not incidental. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say how pleased I was by you using the expression corporate welfare. Because yeah. really, that's so cool. Yeah, it is. I mean, uh, the bottom line is that what a bond is, is a, is a risk free asset with an annuity, that means a guaranteed income at the end of each period of payment, and it allows the, that allows the uh, bondholder 
to park their money risklessly while they're trying to work out the uncertainty in the financial markets. And as Stephen Hale points out, why is Norway with a surplus issue bonds? Yeah. Well, I mean, I can tell you, closer to home, or well, closer to my home, in 2001, the cost, Howard Costello federal government was running surpluses and were paying, not re renewing the debt. When the debt matured, they would just uh, not renew it. And uh, the bond market became very thin. That's an expression to say there's not much bonds out there for people to trade and buy and sell. And who complained about that? The Sydney Futures Exchange because their risk-free pricing asset was suddenly become disappearing. And they had, there was an inquiry which I appeared at, but the outcome of that inquiry was that even though the government kept running fiscal surpluses, they agreed with the investment banks to, to, to issue a minimum amount of bonds each auction to keep the depth of the bond market. Um, and I'm just wondering, I understand there was a very exciting international MMT conference last week that you were at. Um, I was wondering whether you could tell us any more about what happens next, what happens there, and is there any progress in shifting the debate or actually getting universities and academia to broaden their curricula, etc.? The, some bright spark once said that uh, for para to get effective paradigm change, you've got to wait for the, the proponents of the existing paradigm to die. <laughs> uh, we will make very little progress within the academy. Uh, the academy is uh, riddled by, uh, uh, by uh, crippled by what I call groupthink. They're in denial. It's uh, like a system of mob rule. Uh, you'll find if you go around the world, very few heterodox economists ever reach the highest rank of professor. Very few. I'm, a, I'm one of very few people in Australia that's got the full, the full chair with the views I have. Very few people get free. And, and well, we won't go into personal history, but it's, it's uh, uh, been a very difficult process to, and the way I've done it is I get a lot of research income because I can do modelling, econometric modelling, and I can do technical stuff as well as anyone, so that's how I've done it. But, and and I, I, I said to one of my students once, when you're going for Australian Research Council grants, don't use the word Marx. <laughs> and, and that's sort of the way you've got to do it. Um, look, when, uh, in, in around 94, MM, the MMT community, we used to laugh, we can count them on one hand. There was Warren Mosler, myself, and Randy Ray. And then Stephanie Kelton came in, um, her name was then Stephanie Bell before she married. There was four. And for years we worked, we slowly but surely built up a few people around us. We tra we've trained a lot of PhD students now who are going out as a second generation MMT academics. But uh, it wasn't really until we started to use social media. And I remember I was at a meeting with Warren and Randy uh, in the Caribbean, to, actually. Uh, Warren was in the Caribbean. Uh, and uh, I, I announced rather proudly that I was starting a blog in 2004. And Randy just looked at me as if I was from outer space. <laughs> But the, and soon later, sooner rather than later, they got blogs too. The blogs have been incredible dissemination vehicles. And I even sent out some tweets. Because I, I refuse to have a Facebook page because they sell me data privately to, to capitalists to make money. So I refuse that. But the others do, but others use Facebook very effectively. So from very humble beginnings in the early 90s, where for years we just wrote academic articles and books, it wasn't until around 2004 or 5 we started to use social media, and then my blog just went crazy. Now the, the first international modern monetary conference was held in Kansas City last 
week, I started on Thursday night, went through to Sunday, I've just come from there, and there were 250 odd people there at a dedicated MMT conference. Now, that's a dramatic, and hundreds of thousands of people tuning in on the live broadcasts from around the world. And so you just have to do a bit of a search around the internet to see how the proliferation of the ideas is growing. But it takes a long time for entrenched groups to be assailed and uh, probably it's going to take another 20 years. But we've made, what, what, what was established last week from my eyes but is we set out to create something and there's now a lot of people. Uh, going to America to a conference to talk MMT. But another point about that, without labouring it, is that uh, there were papers at that conference, not from economists, there were papers from economists, but uh, there were papers from people in uh, rhetorical studies and uh, literary fiction and uh, film studies, all using the basic concept of MMT to bring insights into much broader humanities and social sciences research. And that's a really great thing because one of the things about the economics profession is that among the social sciences, economists are among the uh, virtually never cross-reference up of social sciences. They're a closed shop, mainstream economics. But MMT seems to be giving a broad humanities and social science academics and researchers a, a voice. And the last thing I'll say about the conference is that it wasn't just an academic conference. There were a lot of non-economists there, as I said, but there were a lot of non-academics there, activists and people who want to develop a voice or give quality to the voice they've already got. And that, so I think we've got something happening.